um, Dr. Fabian Dairit, Dr. Hassan Virgi, Dr. Rajiv Shaw, Dr. Gordon McDean, and all of those, uh, Rosa and all of those present here today. Um, I'm not certain why you invited Cynthia and I. Is it because she is the chair of the Environment Committee and I'm the chairman of the Committee on Finance, or is it because Cynthia and I were born in coastal cities which are at risk? Did you actually think about that? That she was born and still lives in Las Piñas, which is at risk both from natural hazards and possible man-made hazards like reclamation, which is much against. Or did you also invite me because I was born and lived and continue to be a uh, resident of Barrio Potrero in Malabon, which is a risk, a, a, a vulnerable, um, a very vulnerable area in the city. So whichever the reasons are, we are grateful for having us here. And also, I am uh, proud to state that way back in 2000, well, not way back, in 2014, the IRDR uh, conference in Beijing, which said, turn science into DRRM practice. I was there with you as your keynote speaker. And I think that's what we really need to do. You have great researches and policy papers and all these dissertations. We must turn all the scientific research into DRR, not only legislation or policy of government, but also more importantly into DRR and practice, into environmental practice, into practices even of local governance. And also, I would like to uh, thank Father Jeff for his um, very personal uh, welcome message earlier. And I was uh, touched in a way when he said that um, he is a priest who happens to be a scientist. In a way, um, if I may, I just happen to be, how do you say it? You're a priest first before a scientist, right, Father Jeff? Yeah. Yes. I just, I'm an activist who just happens to be a senator. So people sometimes, I, I'm, I would like to consider myself, and many people say that, I'm more of a climate activist who happens to be a senator. And so sometimes when my speeches or my statements go out of the box, it's because I cannot withhold uh, my, my being an activist. And, and sometimes it's difficult to really uh, put that in perspective. But we are all here today, whether scientists or priests or activists or senator or sociologist. I believe we are all here today. We agree that we are at risk. We are vulnerable to climate change risks. And the signs are clearly all around us. The numbers speak for themselves. It is no longer an issue of taking action, but rather of how much action we need to make. Last month, I'm sure you've read this if you Google a lot, residents of Shishmaref, a very small village in Alaska, voted to relocate their community <coughs> from the Sarichef Island that has been steadily sinking into the sea. Sheshmaref is just one of the 31 Alaskan villages that face imminent threats from flooding and coastal erosion. On a global scale, about 200 million people may become permanently displaced by year 2050 due to sea level rise, flooding, and intense droughts. And if global temperatures rises by 2 degrees Celsius, sea level rise is projected to be less than 70 centimeters with warming of up to four degrees Celsius. Sea level rise is projected to be more than 100 centimeters. I believe that the statistics are even more disturbing here in our country. Various studies show that sea level rise around the country is even three to five times faster than the global average rate. And even if we are successful in limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, sea level around the Philippines would still rise to about 70 centimeters, according to the WMO. Sea level rise is just one of the many impacts of climate change. As you know, ocean acidification is causing irreversible damage to our coral reefs. In fact, in the Philippines, we have less than 90% of our corals, coral reefs still in good condition. While the sudden shifts from hot temperature to incessant rains pose uncertainties to agriculture, greatly affecting our food security. 
The warming climate is now one of the most significant risks even for our world heritage sites, including the Philippines' Ifugao Rice Terraces. Extreme rainfall and heavy floods constantly threaten lives, livelihood, and sustainable development. That is why nations, especially those highly vulnerable to climate impacts, such as the Philippines, were not content with the use of the phrase, well below two degrees Celsius goal, when the Paris Agreement was being drafted. Instead, we pushed as part of the CBF, the Climate Vulnerable Forum, and as part of um, the bigger community of nations who are always at risk, we push for the inclusion of the 1.5 degrees global warming limit as our main goal. It was not an easy journey, as you well know, and the Paris Agreement, yet we continue to move forward through the challenging path of pushing for its ratification. At this point, 26 out of the 900, 197 parties to the UNFCC have ratified the agreement, including the US and China, the two biggest emitters of GHGs and they represent 39 degrees, 39% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And for the agreement to enter into force, at least 55 parties to the UNFCC, representing 55% of global greenhouse gas emissions, must ratify it. I am hopeful that it will not take very, very long for our own government to realize the wisdom of completing our process of ratification. I will not belabor that issue as I am quietly but, um, but, but doing my best to push for its ratification. I know that there were statements made by the new government which might have been taken out of context. I am confident that the Paris Agreement for our own good will be ratified. But even as the Paris Agreement has been hailed by many as a landmark agreement, its aspirations will not happen on its own. Bending the global warming curve to 1.5 degrees Celsius is a moral imperative because it means saving the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people. It means upholding the human rights of the poor and the most vulnerable. It means ensuring the integrity of our ecosystems. The Philippines, yes, has committed to a 70% GHG emissions reduction by 2030 from business as usual scenario from energy, transport, waste, industry, and forestry. But this is conditional. We also committed to building the resilience for communities and promoting inclusive growth in accordance with the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Sustainable Development Goals. Allow me to also interject this point that I think it is the first time that the GAA, or General Appropriations Act, which is the most important piece of legislation, or annual budget, had actually mentioned both the Sendai Framework for Action and the Sustainable Development Goal. I guess not many of my colleagues in the lower house and even in the Senate realized that I made that one most important insertion. Not the budget insertion that many would think of like pork, but the insertion of the compliance of all government agencies and departments with Sendai and with SDG. Believe me, it was not even a discussion on the floor. I was never asked about it, maybe because it was deemed so important and not to be discussed, or perhaps nobody noticed the insertion. <laughs> now that I mentioned it, Senator Villar is here, please do not ask me because they might delete it. But this is the most important. Maybe they don't understand. Exactly, exactly. And so let's keep it in this room of 50, please, so that in the 2017 budget, I include it as well. Delivering on our commitments to these global frameworks is our way of telling and showing the world that though we are vulnerable to natural hazards and climate impacts, we are not incapable of action. We need to strengthen the capacities of governments and apply the whole of society approach in integrating responses to climate change within national to local policy frameworks and program of actions. The Philippines has actually the best loss in the world, no less than the former UNISDR head, Margareta Wallstrom has said, and she was referring to many of our laws that we authored in the past 10 years, 
We have the Climate Change Act, which created the Commission on Climate Change, which is headed by the president, no less. I think someone should actually tell the president he actually chairs the Climate Change Commission because uh, the vice chair is just one of the three commissioners. And the End Dream Sea Law, which really mandates that each of the 1,632 cities and municipalities must have a DRR officer. And of course, the People's Survival Fund, which is a mandatory to the climate change law, which has a two billion budget where local governments and communities, CSOs, CANA and POs, people's organization can actually access it for climate adaptation and mitigation programs. So we have all these important laws, not to mention even the Clean Water Act of 2003, RA 9003 of 2001, and that's the Ecological Solid Waste Management Law, and many others. The greater challenge, however, is to translate these national policies, plans, and programs into local action with measurable gain. The cleanup of Manila Bay, for example, will four regions of the country, NCR, Region 3, Region 4, A, three regions, and more than 100 LGUs surround it. Uh, as Cynthia whispered to me uh, earlier, and she said, yes, the water quality of Manila Bay is further deteriorating. In every budget hearing, in every committee hearing since 1998, and it's 2016, the agencies of government admit of the deteriorating level, not just of the Pasig River and LLDA, but also because, but also because of Manila Bay. And considering that there was already a um, Supreme Court decision in 2009, and the continuing mandamus is there, but why are all these agencies not actually able to implement it? Perhaps MO, perhaps the Cities at Risk Program can make the whole Manila Bay project as your centerpiece project. We are willing to fund it. If you are going to tell all these more than 100 <coughs> local governments what to do, because we've told them what to do. Gina Lopez and I, in previous years, not now that the secretary had written the power of the stationery, had written each and every mayor to implement the ecological solid waste management law, reminding them of their responsibility being in Manila Bay. Uh, we're not certain if they're able to comply with that. So there's so much to be done, but it would be great work if the MO and the coastal cities at risk could make all the 100 plus LGUs around Manila Bay as the model, not just for policy making, but even help us implement it with the DPWH, with the DENR and the um, uh, Commission on uh, ESWM Commission and all the other agencies. We have met many times with Justice Presbyterio Velasco of the Supreme Court, who is tasked with the Supreme Court to ask these agencies to compel them to implement the Supreme Court decision of 2009. I got tired of meeting and meeting and meeting. Anyway, but now our government has also continued or started climate tagging their expenditure for climate change adaptation and mitigation and will actually prioritize funding for adaptation to reduce the vulnerability and address the climate risks to our communities. In my capacity now as chair of the Senate Committee on Finance, we were able to transform the 2016 national budget into one that is climate adaptive and disaster resilient. We have actually mainstream provisions that ensure that the implementation of government programs would continue or contribute towards building resilience. And with the help of my colleagues, we will continue to do this in the 2017 national budget. What are the simple, general, and special provisions in the 2015 CAA? There are actually 50, more than 50. Just the mere mention of the creation of water catchment in every government building, we put that because of the 1989 law of the Rainwater Collection Act. So why is it not being implemented? So just as a reminder, I put it in a 2016 GAA, which I hope to replicate in the 217 GAA as well. The repair and retrofitting of bridges and other public infrastructure. The maintenance and operation of dams must be managed with updated protocols so that the release of water of these dams would not adversely impact low-lying communities. 
Evacuation centers must be able to withstand strong typhoons up to 300 kilometers per hour and earthquake up to eight on, on the magnitude of the Richter scale. Even the use of coconut palms as natural windbreakers, even the massive um, uh, rehabilitation of our mangrove areas. These are seemingly little matters, but actually has a large impact if we actually implement this on the local level. On this note, I wish to congratulate everyone behind the Coastal Cities at Risk project. Scientific research, collaboration, and innovation are important for government to design evidence-based decision support systems and to help communities prepare for localized impact assessments. <clears throat> the best climate solutions are possible only with the guidance of science. We need science in developing land use plans that are risk sensitive. The science and research community's role to gather, to validate, to process scientific data is crucial <coughs> in the accurate prediction of events. These are indispensable inputs to designing <coughs> practical solutions and communicate, communicating the risks to our communities. Building resilience is not the duty of the government alone. It is everyone's responsibility. The risks will always be present. Managing the risks is key to resilience. We must be fully aware of the specific risks and vulnerabilities of our community so we can craft the best solutions to effectively manage them. In closing, I wish to stress that we all live in one earth Climate change is now in our midst and it imparts to us the lesson that we do not own this planet. We are mere stewards of its resources. Let us all be reminded of our responsibility to ensure that the future generations will have the benefits of a balanced and healthful ecology. Each of us has opportunities to make a difference for our future. We must lead the way towards meaningful change, change in the way we think, change in the way we live, change in the way we pursue the development and the future we long for, for our children and grandchildren, for all of humanity, for all species in our world, and for Mother Earth. And I would like to take this opportunity to urge you in the science sector to help us with plans that can be operationalized on the local level. And let Manila Bay, perhaps, be the sample or the example of the Coastal at Risk program. We are here to lay before the table all environmental laws we've authored in the past decades, from the Clean Water Act, to the Solid Waste Management Law, to the Climate Change Act, to the Endream Sea Law, and many others. We are also here to provide the funding, if need be, through government agencies, whether the ENR, I'm sure Secretary Lopez would be more than willing to host that, or um, the Climate Change Commission, and so that those government agencies can have a collaboration with the Ateneo and the Manila Observatory, and perhaps other agencies of government and other embassies, other, other governments can also help out. And if we could, if we could really make these cities and towns around Manila Bay more resilient and more adaptive to the vulnerabilities and the risks, then we can say that this discussion here today, attended by 50 brilliant minds, would have been fruitful and productive. With that, thank you very much.